Let's talk about a praying church. The church in the New Testament was a praying church. The, the story of that church largely is found in Acts, the book of Acts, even before the church was established. Acts chapter 1. Those disciples that would make up that early church, the 120 were in an upper room. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The day of Pentecost came and 3,000 were baptized into Christ and it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and breaking of bread, fellowship, but then it says, and in prayers. They continued steadfastly in prayer. You go on in Acts 4, 22 and verse 23. When the apostles were imprisoned, when they were let go, they went into their own company and said they lifted up their voice to God. Now it said they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and what follows is a psalm and so it's clearly that they are singing together here, congregational singing, but they're singing a prayer. And then at the end of the song, it goes into a prayer. Part of that prayer found in verse 31. Now, Lord, grant, uh, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. In Acts chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, when there was a problem with the distribution of the the, the funds and taking care of the widows, they appointed seven men to look after this business. And upon their appointment, it says they prayed and laid hands on them. We read in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, when Peter was released from prison, he went to the house of Mary and they were having a prayer meeting there. Did you know that was on the first day of the week? It doesn't directly state that, but I want you to remember Herod was going to bring Peter out when the days of unleavened bread were passed, and that would have been on a Saturday, and it says it was the next morning he was going to bring Peter forth. Well, that would have been on a Sunday. If it ended on a Sabbath, his next day would be a Sunday. And uh, it was about midnight at the dawn of that first day of the week. The angel came and released Peter from prison. And they were already gathered together at Mary's house for a prayer meeting. Acts 13, verses 2 and 3. When Paul and Barnabas went on that first missionary journey from Antioch, the uh, prophets and teachers that were there at Antioch met with them, and they fasted and prayed. And then when Paul went on that journey and taught in those synagogues, and, and they were in those synagogues. They knew that the Jesus was coming, the Messiah was coming. Paul was able to teach them upon his return, he appointed elders in every church. Well, these were probably men that had been elders of the synagogues. But now they're going to be elders in the church. And upon their appointment, it says they prayed with fasting. Acts chapter 20 and verse 36. After Jesus had talked with the elders at Ephesus, he's going to go and continue his journey to Jerusalem. But he knelt down and prayed with them all. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 5, they came to Tyre and he visited with the brethren at Tyre. And it said, they brought us on our way with wives and children. I want you to think about that. You know, we've got, did you know we have children in here this morning? If you listen, you might hear them sometime. Children, isn't that wonderful? I wonder if when they were on that shore and they were praying with wives and children, they could hear the little voices of the little children. I just think it's so significant that those mothers wanted those children to know who Paul was and brought them down to that shore. And there were those little children. They had a prayer for Paul. In Acts chapter 28 and verse 15, as Paul was approaching Rome, some of the Christians from Rome heard he was coming and came down. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. 
over and over and over again, you see that that church in the New Testament was praying. Well, that's what you would expect, wouldn't you? Out of those who were in Christ to want to go to God in prayer. And that's what they were doing. Now, Paul's going to give some instructions concerning prayer. And the prayer he gives in 1 Timothy is in the context of praying in the church. Praying in the assembly. Now we know that's the context. Because Paul said it was. In 1 Timothy 3 verses 14 and 15 he said these things I write unto you. Now notice that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The word church means assembly. Now, I know we want to teach little children how to behave when they come to church, you know, and so we teach them when well, you, you stay quiet and you try to listen to the preacher and, and you don't run into the little lady. You know, we, we teach that. But he's really here talking about Things that go on when that church is assembled. Look at all what he's talked about. The, the false teachers warning about them. He's going to be talking about prayer and the role of women in teaching. And then he's going to talk about elders and deacons. And at the end, he says that you might know how to behave yourself in the church. How do, how do you conduct the services of the church? How do you order the things about the church? That's the context. When he talks about prayer. Let me read those instructions. And then we'll get a little further into this. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 8. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereof I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ, I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, were you thinking of the prayers in the assembly when I read that? I hope so. And if you were, it just, it just brings everything Paul says into focus. There's time for, for private prayer when you go into your closet. But these are instructions concerning behavior in the church and about public prayer. Now I want you to notice the use of the word men in here. He's not talking about males. The, the word here is in the Greek word anthropos. You've heard of, you, that might remind you of something, an anthropoid or something. Uh, anthro, it's mankind, mankind. In fact, I think it's the latest edition of the new American Standard Bible. If I'm right on what they've done here, they've added some words to try to clarify that. And I thought, Probably best just leave those words out. But what they'll say is giving a thanks to be made for all men. And then they put and women. Just to make sure you know women are included in this word uh, anthropos. The word translated men here. And we usually speak of that when we talk about all men. We're not excluding women. That's the word. Look how this is referring to all mankind here. He says it in verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. That's not males. That's every person. It says in uh, verse 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and men. Whether you're a man or a woman, there's one mediator between us. And then it says the man, Jesus Christ. 
You know, that's another form of that same word. It's talking there not about Christ being a male. It's talking about Christ being a human person. God in the flesh. He became a man. He became just like one of us in the flesh. It's not, not specific to his being a male, but to his being human. But then look at verse 8. Now this might not show up in your translation, but it's a different word. He's been talking about men and women, men and women, men and women, men and women, and down in verse 8, I will therefore that men, now that's males, it's a different word. He changed the word on us, and there's a reason. Men are to lead the prayers in the assembly. I will therefore that males pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, going on from this, he says in like manner also that women. You see how he's contrasting now males and females. And he talks about women in verse 10 and women in verse 11 and women in verse 12, but then he says not to usurp authority over the males. That's men. Different words now than all mankind. He's talking about the role of men and the role of women. That's why when the church gathers together and, and someone's going to lead us in prayer, we look out among the men to lead us. Now, get, let me make sure you understand that. There is no restriction on women praying. The restriction is on women leading the prayers in that assembly. When, when a man stands up here and leads this congregation in prayer, okay, women, I want you to do this. Look, think about this. Just like all the men, all the women are to be praying. That's what we do when we sing, isn't it? A man leads a song. That means that we are singing, and that's our song. We're singing that song. We're singing it to God. He's simply leading the song, and that's what leading the prayer is. You're not up here listening to a man say his prayer. He's leading you in prayer. Now, you can think so much faster than a man can think. Now, that doesn't go just for women. That's men and women. You, know. you can think so much faster than a uh, I, uh, I know women think they can think faster than men can think anyway. <laughs> but I'm talking about uh, someone up here speaking. You can think of a lot of things while I'm up here speaking. That, and you can go off and think those thoughts and come back around and not miss a thing I said, can't you? you? You've done that. You're probably doing it right now, thinking of things and still not missing a word I said because you didn't, you didn't just think fast and come around. And that's what you're doing when someone's leading us in prayer. You're praying your prayer. You ever heard someone, we pray for all those who are sick. And you're probably thinking, I'm going to pray for this person, my neighbor that is sick. This per I'm thinking of that person that is sick. And you could thank a half a dozen people before he utters the next voice. Because you're praying and he's leading that prayer. No restriction on women praying. The restriction is on men leading, uh, on women leading the prayer. And that's why he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Uh, Paul, when he would go out to preach, he would beckon with his hand. Now people see his hand up, and they say, okay, he's going to say something, and he gets attention. You know, that's why we lift our hands. We lift our hands to get attention. Now, a lot of times what our men do, they'll stand up in front of us and we get their attention automatically. I have been places where I've been sitting out in the middle of the pew and they've called on me to lead the prayer. And I can't even get out of the pew. I'll lead it from right where I am. But often what I'll do is i lead, I'll raise my hand and pray just so people know I'm the one leading that prayer. I'm getting attention. Some people just like attention. You'll see some people out in worship and they're not leading anything. They're just part of work and they hold up their hands 
I tell you, they're getting attention. But sometimes that attention is inappropriate. It's appropriate for a leader to get attention. He's going to lift up his hands for attention. Put that in the context of leading a public prayer. But look what it says about the women. Adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. He's really not talking about their clothes. He's writing about their behavior in the church. And they're to behave modestly. And that word, shamefaced, shamefaced. You get down to the roots of what that word means in the Greek. Here's what it means. With, with downcast eyes. With downcast eyes. Compare the holding up the hand with downcast eyes. Now, Gary and Dee aren't here this morning, so I'm going to pick on them. If I was to say, uh, Gary, why, he's just liable to hold his hand up. You know, I mean, here, he's talking about me. <laughs> but if I was to say, now, D, you know what D would do? She'd probably just put her eyes down. She didn't want that attention. And that's a natural response. Well, it's not literally holding the hand up. It's not literally casting the eyes down. But it's talking about the behavior. When someone is leading prayer, women with shamefacedness, you're, gonna, you're not wanting to get the attention. You're wanting to pray. And so you'll pray with downcast eyes. Well, the man's going to pray lifting up his hand as he leads that prayer. Now, first of all, first of all, that puts the importance on what I'm saying here. First of all, it's not the first thing he mentioned. He's not saying you have to begin the assembly with a prayer. It, it, he's just saying, now this is that important. This is one of those first things. Um, have you ever heard someone stand up, and it's not really good grammar, but they say, well, now first off, <laughs> well, it's, it's a matter of importance they're talking about, not of order. So first of all, supplication. Prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks. A supplication is a humble appeal. A prayer, it's an address to deity. An intercession is an intimate appeal. And most often that word is used when you're going to pray for someone else. And then giving of thanks. These things have to do with making requests. But when we make requests, we should remember to give thanks. God has already blessed us abundantly. Paul talks in the, in the book of Philippians that prayers and supplications should be made. With thanksgiving. And so we thank God for what he has done for us. Even as we appeal for more blessings. He says for all men. All men. Who does that include? Well that means my family. That means my neighbors. That means my friends. And that means my enemies. Pray for them that persecute you. Everyone standing in need of prayer. And we can make intercession for them in our prayers. But specifically here, something to pray for in a public prayer. And I praise you, brethren. <laughs> like Paul said, this is often mentioned in the prayers here at Rockcliffe. And that is for kings and all that are in authority. Doesn't it just thrill you when you hear... One after another, the men stand up here and they pray for our president, for our senators and congressmen, for those who are in civil authority. I tell you, they need our prayers. And, and it's a big job. What an awesome responsibility to have the power that is invested in them to try to govern the behavior of society and to do that in a way, and they're going to be held accountable before God to how they do that. They need our prayers. 
Well, what do we pray for concerning them? Do you pray in the next election my man might win? Well, you might. The Holy Spirit will know what to do with that prayer if that's what you do. I mean, he'll, he'll fix your prayer if you pray, pray in a wrong way. But he says to pray that we may live quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know, the civil authorities can really foul things up and create chaos. But what we want is competent authorities that govern society in such a way that we can live a good life, a, a good life and a peaceable life, so we can live godly, so we can live honestly. That's what our prayers ought to be. And you know, we can follow our prayer with a vote in America. Some people say, well, I'll just pray, and that'll take but you can also take action regarding your prayers. That's how we should think about how are we going to vote? We want to vote for those who we think would help us live a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That ought to be forefront. And here's the reason. Here's the reason we want that kind of stable society. It's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We want our civil authorities to govern in such a way that the gospel will have free reign and be able to reach the hearts of people, that we'll be able to preach and worship in the way that God wants us to. You know, it would be very important in public prayers in Ephesus to say, now you remember to pray for those in authority. You remember how they raised such a riot in Ephesus? And uh, there was a lot of rumor that the church was a secret group to, to subvert order in society. Well, let's say someone comes in and see what that church is all about. We're going to see what they're up to. And they're up there praying for those in authority. The the. Members of the church should be the exemplary citizens of their earthly kingdoms. And we want to pray for those who are in authority. We're not trying to raise rebellion against them or subvert them. And then it talks about the one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. That's why we pray. We end our prayers. In Jesus' name. Job, in all his misery, wanted to talk to God and didn't know how. He said, oh, that there was a daysman. Uh, that would be a person that I could go to that could go to God. Well, Jesus is that mediator. We pray to God because of Jesus. If we'll talk with Jesus, He'll bring those prayers before God the Father. And so he's the one mediator between God and man. And he gave himself that he could do this. And Paul's saying, that's why I'm preaching. I'm preaching because he has done this. That's why I'm preaching Jesus. And then I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands without wrath and doubting. Wrath and doubt. You ever struggled with wrath? You ever been just so angry? Or doubt. Well, surely you have. Who hasn't? What do you do when you're struggling with wrath and you're struggling with doubt? I'll tell you what you do. Take it to the Lord in prayer. But do it in your closet. There's some kinds of prayers that are best suited for the closet. Now, men, when you stand up to lead us in prayer, it's not your private prayer that you're paying in public. If you have private issues that you need to talk to God about, go to your closet and pray those prayers. But when you stand up to lead the prayer, I want you to remember you're leading me in prayer. And I want you to pray things that I can follow you along with, things that are appropriate for the whole congregation to pray together. Your own personal wrath and doubt will take care of that in your closet. When you stand up to lead prayer, think of what's appropriate 
for the whole congregation to pray together and then lead us in those things about prayer. So let's summarize the lesson. Who leads the church in prayer? Well, men do. Men lead. They lift up holy hands. Men without wrath and doubting. Think about the kind of men that are leading us in prayer. Holy hands. That has to do, the word holy there is a little different than the word set apart. It's a different word. This had to do with clean hands. Clean hands. You want some good men leading us in prayer. Uh, they've got clean hands. They're not up there angry. They're not up there doubting. They understand what they're doing. Those are the kinds of men. For whom should the church pray? Pray for all men. All men. But specifically now, for those in authority. And what should the church pray? That we can lead a quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. And the men should come to the knowledge of the truth. Men, when you get on the list and you see your name is here, so they're going to lead us in prayer today. The dismissal prayer. They're going to lead the um, opening prayer. Or put, when they do that, think about these words that Paul wrote to Timothy. And then pray with a confidence. You're following those instructions. And pray in that manner. What a privilege it is to take it to the Lord in prayer. See, that's one of the reasons we want to be children of God. Children of God are those that can pray, Our Father who art in heaven. And then Jesus is there standing between us. Says, yes. He just prayed to you, my Father. Listen to this prayer. And so, we want to be in Christ. When we're in Christ, that's one of the conditions of effective prayer. So if you need to be in Christ this morning and be baptized into Christ, you can come forward as we stand and sing the invitations.